A public inquiry into a contaminated blood scandal described as the worst treatment disaster in NHS history opens today. Thousands of patients who had transfusions in the 1970s and 1980s were given blood products from overseas infected with hepatitis C and HIV. At least 2,400 people have died as a result. Our health correspondent Catherine Burns reports. It was supposed to keep them alive, but for many, it was a death sentence. Thousands of people were infected with HIV and hepatitis C after getting contaminated blood. It's impossible to know how many people were infected by transfusions during surgery or childbirth, and thousands of haemophiliacs received contaminated blood too. There weren't enough supplies in the UK, so some was imported from America, from paid donors and prison inmates. He just was an incredibly brave man. Barbara Scott's husband, Ronald, had haemophilia and contracted HIV. He died a few days after his 50th birthday. It feels like, you know, you've kind of dragged your children up as best you can. And that, in many ways, you know, this, the state is indifferent to the plight of these people. There was a privately funded review in 2009, but it had no official status. In 2015, families dismissed a Scottish inquiry as a whitewash. Now, after years of campaigning, this inquiry will be led by a judge and will be able to compel witnesses to give testimony. The key questions are, when did authorities know about the risks and did they act quickly enough on that information? Catherine Burns, BBC News. Well, let's go to our health correspondent, Sophie Hutchinson, who is outside Church House right now for us. Sophie, over to you. Well, today is a big day for the victims of the infected blood scandal and their families. They have come here in their hundreds to see the start of what are preliminary hearings at this historic public inquiry. They want answers to why the NHS used blood infected with HIV and hepatitis to treat patients with haemophilia, others who needed blood transfusions because of road traffic accidents, etc. Now, one of those with, who died, um, who had haemophilia, was um, Edward Burkett. His daughter, Eileen, is with me now. Um, Eileen, and your son as well, uh, Jake. Um, you've come here today. Um, how important a day is this for you? Extremely important. Um, obviously, you know, we want answers for what happened to uh, our dads uncles, cousins that were haemophiliacs that were infected. Tell me a bit about your father. He suffered from haemophilia, yeah. so he needed a blood clotting agent he because did, yeah. he was prone to bleed. Yeah, yeah. You got a call to say he was in hospital and he, he yeah. died of a bleed to his brain. Yeah. What did you um, find out subsequently? Well, just in the room when they told us that, um, you know, that my father were on a life support machine, that he'd had a bleed to the brain. Um, they informed us at that moment that my dad was uh, HIV positive and that he had AIDS. Um, so it floored us as a family because we didn't have a clue. It was a complete uh, shock yeah. to you. Yeah. And what, what were you thinking then? Uh, well, at the initial time, we just wanted to go and see him. You know, we, we were more we were worried because they said he was poorly and that he, you know he weren't going to come out of this coma that he was in. Um, so we all just panicked and sort of like forgot about that went to see him and then obviously afterwards it all came out through our family told us little bits and bats but after that we never heard anything about it again um, we had no information from the hospital nobody contacted us to give us any any kind of information at all so how quickly did you come to understand that it was through infected blood that your father had 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 con contracted HIV um, AIDS sorry out Sorry. How, how, when, when did you find out that it was oh. due to the infected blood? That um, he... uh, well, just afterwards we spoke to family because we've lost um, two uncles and a cousin to this as well. Uh, they were co-infected as well. Um, so they sort of explained to us that it had been given to him through the, you know, the treatment for his haemophilia. So, and uh, the hepatitis C, I didn't find out about that, that until 2011. When I had a little search on the and internet. he died in 1992. He died in 1992. Yeah. 
So what do you want to come out of this inquiry? Well, as family, we want answers to what happened to our father and why he was given this. Um, Dad were a landscape gardener, he were always outside. He worked, you know, he, he banged his hands and, and had his bleeds. Um, the treatment that they gave them, home treatment, what they used, were better than him going into hospital. But, you know, I just, we just want answers. We want to know why it was given to them when it was supposed to help them, you know, look after their haemophilia. Well, wow. okay. best of luck with that. Okay, thank you. Today's um, preliminary hearings will, will begin with a short film to commemorate those who were infected, those some of many of whom have died, others who are still living with the consequences of being given infected blood. Now back to you. Thank you very much, Sophie. Well, we can talk now to Clive Smith, who's a trustee at the Haemophilia Society, joins us from the inquiry in central London. Thank you very much for joining us, Clive. I'm not sure if you could hear our guests just then, but uh, a daughter talking about the, the devastating impact on their family of, of their father uh, contracting HIV AIDS through, through a transfusion for haemophilia. Um, and, and saying they, they just had no idea what had gone on and obviously the questions that come when somebody is suffering from an illness that they, they initially wouldn't have known at all how it was contracted. How traumatic has this been for, for families who've been affected? It's been incredibly traumatic for families and um, they've been living through it for over 30 years now. Many of them have been suffering silence. Many of them are still going through it. So although we talk about the 70s and 80s, this is something there are still people dying, sadly. There are still people who are not getting the care they need and not getting the financial support they need as well. So it's been extremely traumatic and undoubtedly the inquiry will, whilst it will rake over old ground, it will also cover new ground and create new memories and difficulties for people to deal with in the future. Support have people had? Because we heard in our report earlier that the wife of, of one victim said the state has, has just been indifferent to the plight of people like her. Very much so. So in terms of financial support, government have never really accepted responsibility for what happened. Um, it's always been ex gratia payment, so based on the, the, on the principle that there's been no fault, as it were. So people have effectively been given subsistence. No one's ever really been compensated properly for this, unlike in other jurisdictions, such as Ireland and in Canada, for example. Mm. So as I say, those, that injustice, as it were, has been, it was compounded. So the fact that people were infected as a result of this, that they're the tragedy has been confounded by the way that governments of all colours have responded to this in the years since. You, you said that people, many people have been suffering in silence. Of course, when a situation that affects many first hits and individuals don't know that others are affected, they do suffer in silence. How much of a change has talking about it made and how much of a change will this inquiry make? It is making a significant change. So we had a meeting yesterday with our members and obviously people are coming together today and people feel that they're able to come and meet people, like-minded individuals, and speak to them. So unlike other um, tragedies such as Grenfell, for example, where there was some big visual event for people to, to gather around and, and for the public to really see, this has been something where, as I say, all those events have happened individually to people in their homes or in hospitals or wherever they've spent their last, uh, last days and weeks and months of their lives. So. It has been a cathartic experience, I think, for the community in terms of being able to get together and actually be able to talk about it. And the, the inquiry team are putting on support today through the Red Cross to enable people to speak about it and discuss it. Even for those who can't attend today, there is phone line, phone line assistance for them as well. I, I spoke last week to somebody about the particular aspect of hepatitis um, and the fact that there are concerns that that people who have contracted hepatitis C as a result of transfusions, many of them wouldn't have even known because it's described as a silent killer and the, the symptoms can be hidden for years. Are you concerned that there are many people out there who, who still may not know or because of haemophilia would most people who've been affected in that context be aware? In terms of the community, there are really two sides of the community, as you say, and I represent the Haemophilia Society, so most of our patients, we would imagine, would know by now they've inevitably been tested. But as you rightly allude to, there is also the whole blood community. So people, for example, like Anita Roddick, who many people have heard about, who were given blood during childbirth. Um, there's been no proper look-back exercise by government. That was the one recommendation which came from the Penrose Inquiry, which took place in Scotland, that government should undertake some sort of look-back exercise. 
that's still not happened some 30 years later. Mm. There are people even now only finding out about their diagnosis when they become ill, when they go to the doctors and find out. So very much we support that side in terms of calling for that recommendation from the inquiry. And we would also suggest that that doesn't need to wait until the end of the inquiry. We know that the inquiry may well make interim recommendations. That's something we don't need to wait until the end of the inquiry to deal with. Thank you very much. Clive Smith from the Haemophilia Society.